A fever is thought to be present in anywhere from 26 to 88% of patients in the ICU, really depending on the type of ICU, with the medical ICU being the most common. In fact, 70% of ICU admissions are complicated by fever. There's a lot to understand about this physiologic process, so let's get into talking about fever now. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card, as well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. All right, I've got a lot of different things to explain about fever in our critically ill patients. That said, there's still a lot of unknown really when it comes to this topic. My goal is to try to explain what is happening and the things that we're focused on, but also to perhaps muddy up some of the perspective on fever itself. So we'll start off this lesson talking about what is fever. So fever, also known as pyrexia, is a physiologic response of our immune system. It is the resetting of the body's thermostat to a higher set point. Now, this is different than hyperthermia, which is often used to refer to increased body temperature due to external sources or increased heat production, and not necessarily resetting of the body's regulatory mechanisms. So an example of this would be like heat stroke from exercising out in warm temperatures. Now, hyperthermia typically isn't something that we see in the ICU necessarily, and it's often handled down in the emergency department. Now, normothermia or normal body temperature is considered to be around 38.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. And our temperature actually varies quite a bit throughout the day and can often range anywhere from 96 to 100.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which comes out to 35.6 to 38.2 Celsius. Now, fever is technically defined by the CDC and the World Health Organization as a temp that's greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. That said, though, the American College of Critical Care Medicine, so the ACCCM, and the Infectious Disease Society of America, ITSA, have set an arbitrary definition of fever for ICU patients as a temperature that's greater than 101.0 Fahrenheit or 38.3 Celsius. So it's this temperature here in which we really kind of consider our patients in the ICU as actually having a fever. Now, hyperpyrexia, on the other hand, is actually an extremely high fever with temperatures that are greater than 105.8 Fahrenheit, which comes out to 41 degrees Celsius. So this is not nearly as common as regular pyrexia, and typically we find that this is going to be associated with some sort of neurological issues. Now, the measurement of temperature, though, is truly an important vital sign, and it often prompts us for an infectious workup for this patient. That said, fever is a nonspecific response of the body. It simply tells us that there's something going on, not necessarily what that something is. And fever in patients in the ICU has been associated with longer hospital stays, increased cost, and poor outcomes. It plays an important data point in mortality scores such as the Apache 2 score. That said, as I'll discuss in a minute, the evidence is really unclear on the effects of fever on mortality. All right, so next let's talk real quickly about the pathophysiology of fever. So fever is really common throughout nature and in fact in many species. Most species actually mount a fever in response to an infection. Therefore, this is a very natural reaction for our patients and it's something really hardwired into our evolution from probably long before we were ever here. Now, there are different pathways that can result in fever from uh, neurological to chemical pathways, but for the sake of this discussion here, I'm going to exclude the neurogenic causes as that really kind of warrants its own discussion. 
So to begin, we have the hypothalamus in the brain, which is really what's responsible for regulating the core body temperature. So it really functions like a thermostat. So it's controlling the set temperature for the body. Now the white blood cells that make up our immune system are the ones that are responsible for responding to exogenous stimuli. So this can be the result of an infectious organism or inflammation in the body. As a part of this response, certain cytokines are gonna be released. So we have IL-1, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are the three that are really identified as playing a role in our fever response. Now the release of these particular cytokines cause endothelial cells to release COX-2 and prostaglandin E2, also known as PGE2. These then cause the release of cyclic AMP and ultimately causing the hypothalamus to increase the body's temperature set point. So while it's not necessarily important that you kind of understand the steps that are involved, you can kind of see that it's a cascade of events that take place. Now, the result of having the hypothalamus set point being increased actually leads to a few physiologic and behavioral changes. Behavioral changes you can really kind of think of more in like the animal world with some of the cold-blooded animals that seek out warmer temperatures, but could probably also be related to feeling cold, wrapping up in blankets, trying to keep warm, stuff like that whenever you've had a fever. Now, some of the physiologic changes that we see is we actually see peripheral vasoconstriction, and this is working to conserve heat loss by shunting blood away from the periphery. So this can often explain why sometimes early in fever that the patient may actually feel cool to the touch. Now this is also going to trigger our fat thermogenesis and this is going to be taking place in the liver, muscle cells, as well as in our brown adipose tissue. And then shivering is also another mechanism that can be used to increase body temperature as well. So the combination of these three physiologic effects is going to work to elevate our body's own internal core temperature, resulting in pyrexia or fever. So now let's talk about some of the different causes of this fever response. So we can really think of our causes of fever being in two broad categories. First, we have our infectious causes, and then we have our non-infectious causes. So for infectious causes, this is often what we're thinking of when it comes to fever with our patient. In fact, a study of ICU patients with fever found that 63% of them actually had sepsis. So this is a very common reason on why your patient would have a fever. Now, some of our typical culprits for infectious causes, especially in the ICU, are things like our bacteremia, our CLABSIs, our CAUDIs, and especially our ventilator-acquired pneumonia or VAP. Other potential causes to kind of be on the lookout for are things like sinusitis, colitis, whether this is related to C. diff or not, cellulitis and abscesses. Sometimes those abscesses can easily be missed. Pressure injuries can do this as well. Endocarditis is another one that's overlooked along with osteomyelitis. And then definitely our surgical wound infections as well. So that really said, any potential infectious process can lead to a fever response in our patients. And thus really having that good history and physical, those good assessments should really help to identify any potential causes in our patients. Now for our non-infectious causes, this itself is actually a pretty broad grouping. This does include the non-infectious causes such as like central nervous system derangements, malignant hyperthermia, serotonin syndrome, stuff like that. But often when we're thinking of these non-infectious causes, we're going to be thinking of inflammatory processes that could be responsible for fever beyond just those infectious sources. So one common thing that can actually lead to inflammation and fever is clots. So this can include our DVTs, our PEs, myocardial infarctions, CVAs, and even acute limb ischemia. Transfusion reactions are another source of fever. This can be both the hemolytic and non-hemolytic. Cholecystitis, pancreatitis, both of these can lead to inflammation and fever. And then another thing to be thinking about is generally post-op. This is often an expected response in the first 48 hours after surgery. That said, if our patient has persistent fevers beyond the 72-hour mark, then usually this is going to warrant that infectious workup and our concern for some sort of surgical site infection. We can also see drug fevers, which can really complicate the picture in the ICU, and these can account anywhere from 3 to 5% of fevers that we see. Our most common culprits for these are going to be our antibiotics, our antiepileptics, antiarrhythmics, diuretics, allopurinol, and even heparin can do this too. These particular fevers usually appear after 7 to 10 days and then resolve themselves within 72 hours. 
And then some other potential non-infectious causes include our malignant processes and our autoimmune disorders. Again, this isn't a fully inclusive list of things, but just some things for you to kind of be aware of and to be thinking about and keeping your eye on as well, especially when your patient has that fever. All right, so let's talk about the impact of fever on our patient. And the real question when it comes to fever is whether or not it's a positive thing for the patient or not. Given its strong evolutionary presence, it really makes us wonder whether there is a benefit to having a fever. So when looking at some potential benefits, a fever has some expected benefits to the patient that can really help to eliminate an infectious organism. So in vitro studies have shown that increases in temperatures to ranges that we consider a fever in humans can actually increase antibiotic sensitivity, increase phagocytosis of our macrophages, it can reduce bacterial growth, and it can improve the mobility of white blood cells throughout the body. So this fever can actually help to influence in a positive way our immune response while also working to fight against the particular pathogen itself as well as the use of those antibiotics. That said, there are some negative effects to having a fever as well. So first, we definitely see an increase in metabolic demand. And this is especially for sick patients in the ICU that this can potentially have disastrous consequences neurologically or cardiovascularly. Another thing to really consider is that fever often causes discomfort in our patients. So out of compassion, we're often wanting to relieve this discomfort for them by reducing that fever. Again, think about the times that you've been sick and you've had a fever. It's really an uncomfortable thing. Febrile seizures are another potential negative effect, especially so in kids. And then there is also the potential for collateral tissue damage from having a fever as well. So even though it may potentially have some evolutionary benefit in helping us to fight off the particular infectious organism, there are also some serious negative side effects that can result from it. So we're kind of left with the question of, is the fever good or is it evil? Whether or not the fever is a good thing for a patient or it's a bad thing. And really this debate has been going on since the dawn of medicine. And my goal here today isn't to be able to definitively answer this question, but to give you some perspective to consider. So one thing we do know is we do know that patients with acute neurologic injury in the presence of fever can actually have very detrimental effects on mortality for these specific patients. I did talk about this in the lesson on hypothermia where I kind of went into some of those studies that looked at these. So if you want some more information on those, definitely refer to that lesson, which I'll link to up above. But in 1995, we had a small study that actually identified the effects of cooling febrile patients to try to reduce their oxygen consumption. It was a very small study, but basically in this study, they did show that we had a reduction in our VO2 for patients who were actively being cooled. And this goes to the point of one of those negative effects of having that increased metabolic demand. So by reducing the fever, we decrease that metabolic demand. In 1997, we had another study that looked at using ibuprofen to treat fever in septic patients, and this did show a reduction in temperature, oxygen consumption, tachycardia, and lactic acidosis in the patients who received ibuprofen. That said, though, there was no reduction in shock, incidence of ARDS, as well as mortality differences seen in these patients. So while it did impact some of these things that we typically see and we look at and we're looking for, at the end of the day, it really didn't seem to have any impact on outcomes for them. To follow that up, in 2015, there was a randomized controlled trial known as the HEAT trial, and this was completed looking at acetaminophen in the use of febrile ICU patients with suspected infection. And here, the results suggested that there was no benefit in mortality for those patients who had their fevers reduced. We had a study in 2012 that looked at fever-reducing agents for septic and non-septic patients. In this study, they found that mortality was increased for non-septic patients who had a fever greater than 39.5 Celsius, but this didn't hold true for septic patients. This was also regardless of whether they received any antipyretic therapy or not. They also found that in septic patients, mortality was actually increased in those patients that had their fevers reduced. So really, we began to see some stark differences between outcomes both for septic versus non-septic fevers, as well as whether or not patients received treatment, what that level of fever was for the patient. There were these different intricacies that seemed to affect the outcomes for different patients. And really, this study 
help to show that perhaps the underlying etiology of the fever may be more important in the decision whether or not to treat the fever. In 2017, we had another randomized controlled trial that was performed called the REACTOR trial, and this one again also showed an early reduction in our patient's temperature, but no difference in the length of ICU stay or mortality. In 2019, another trial concern for the increased metabolic demand on the critically ill patient showed no benefit on mortality in reducing fever. And then in 2020, another study again evaluated antipyretic therapy to reduce fever and found no benefit in ICU stay, incidence of shock, or mortality. And then finally, to muddy the waters even more, there was a small study that was actually just published this year that looked at the use of therapeutic hyperthermia for afebrile septic patients. And it did find a mortality benefit in those patients who had their temperatures increased. So that was a lot of studies and a lot of different information, but what does this all mean? Well, I think the answer is we aren't entirely sure. There are clearly cases where having a fever can have detrimental effects on our patients, specifically those patients with neurological injuries, as well as those high temperatures and non-septic patients. There does seem to be some evidence supporting that there's no mortality benefit in just treating a fever because there is a fever. There certainly is the concern for those negative effects, especially those on the metabolic demand for the sickest of the sick patients, but there doesn't seem to be any strong evidence showing that if we actually reduce that fever and thus the metabolic demand, that this is influencing survivability for these patients. In fact, based on that 2012 study, there may be an increase in mortality when treating the fever of septic patients, so there may be some benefit of that host response that we really don't want to inhibit for them. I think at the end of the day, the decision to treat the patient's fever is really going to depend on a lot of different factors, including how sick they are and their physiologic consequence that the fever is causing for them, especially and also including our patient's comfort. All right, so now that I've hopefully muddied the waters up enough and got you thinking about, hmm, maybe should we be treating this fever or what should we be doing with it for our patients, let's talk about some of our evaluation, treatment, and management of these patients. Now, when we are evaluating our patient with fever, there is a few things that we do want to keep in mind. So for patients in the ICU, we really should be utilizing a core temperature measurement for proper management. So there's many factors that can impact our peripheral measures, such as our oral, axillary, and temporal temperatures. And really here, our gold standard is the temperature measure from the tip of a PA catheter. Unfortunately, this is far from uncommon, especially outside of the cardiac ICU. Therefore, the next best thing would be a bladder temperature probe or an esophageal temperature probe. Rectal probes and temps will also get us closer to core temperature, and they certainly are a viable option as well. Now, we do want to evaluate different labs as well as our microbiology. And first off, blood cultures really should be drawn on all patients that have a new fever. Other cultures should also be done on areas of suspicion to potentially identify any sources of possible infection. So these include our sputum cultures, our bronchioalveolar lavages or our BALs for pneumonia, urine cultures, wound cultures, CSF, anything that potentially would apply to your patient. And remember that our cultures should be drawn before any antibiotics are administered. Other various labs can be used to help identify possible sources of infection and inflammation. We have our CBC, which can help identify hemorrhages. We also have the white blood cell counts on there. Our CMPs and our LFTs, we really want to be checking our kidney and liver function. Doing a serum amylase and lipase, especially in patients that have abdominal pain, can be helpful in evaluating for and ruling out pancreatitis. Antiglobulin if we have a suspected transfusion reaction, thyroid profile for thyroid storm, acetylcholine for adrenal insufficiency. CRP is also another thing that we can check, which we do see it increases with inflammatory processes, as well as procalcitonin is another biomarker that we have specifically for sepsis. That's actually a better indicator for severity than just looking at our CRP. Imaging is another thing that we can use to help evaluate for patients who have fevers. Chest x-rays are obviously going to be helpful to try to identify pneumonia. Ultrasounds or CT scans, these can really be used to evaluate various parts of the body for those possible sources of infection or inflammation. So identifying things like abscesses, fluid collections, pneumonia, inflammation such as cholecystitis, etc. As well as endoscopic evaluation may also be helpful. So this can include our bronchoscopy for evaluation and BAL collection, as well as endoscopy and colonoscopy can be helpful at times too. 
Now, when it comes to our treatment and management, really kind of first and foremost is going to be our source control. For a patient that has a suspected infection, we really need to establish source control. So identifying the possible source of the infection is going to be vital in being able to sample as well as treat that particular infection. Also included in this is the replacing of any lines and catheters that our patient might have. Now, also antibiotics are going to play an important role, especially in those infectious causes that are a result of bacteria. And so in these cases, we're typically going to be starting with those broad spectrum antibiotics. And then this should be started as soon as possible, but after our cultures are being drawn. Now, based on the results of those cultures, then the antibiotics that are being used should be narrowed down to attack the specific culprit. And we do need to make sure that we are de-escalating and stopping our antibiotic treatment when it is complete to help to try to avoid more antibiotic resistance. And then finally, the last thing here is going to be our antipyretics. And as I previously mentioned and covered pretty decently with some of those studies, this certainly is a topic for debate. Some common fever reduction medications that we use include acetaminophen and ibuprofen, but other techniques such as just uncovering the patient, utilizing cold compresses, ice packs, and cooling blankets and devices can also be used to reduce our patient's fever. So as you can see, the fact that our patient is presenting with a fever is actually a pretty complex thing to be dealing with. There could be a lot of different causes, both infectious and non-infectious, that could lead to our patient having this fever, and therefore the ways that we treat and deal with it are going to vary differently based on whether it's infectious or not. And then there's obviously a lot of debate about what is the appropriate way to manage, both from a patient and family perspective that, you know, if they see us not treating a fever, sometimes this can create the perception that we're not doing anything for their loved one, as well as even just on a medical personnel sense of things that I think a lot of people just expect that when we reach a certain point with our fever, that it is just something that we're going to treat and to reduce that fever down. I'm not saying one way is right or the other, but it definitely seems like there is some mixed information out there and certainly will be interesting to see as time goes on, as more studies will certainly be done, if there's anything that really kind of stands out as a clear way in which we should be managing these. But at the end of the day, I think it really is going to be so much dependent on that particular patient's unique situation. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.